Let's see your Bibles this morning. Words, see your pens, pens, your lesson plan. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 7. I um, am having ear, nose, and throat issues, ENT issues. And one of the, uh, so I'm going to be talking a little like Mr. Rogers today. But uh, one of the symptoms is that when I get up in the morning, I, I get dizzy, and the whole room will do like that. So as soon as I put my head up, it seems like the room just keeps going up and down. And so I was calling a um, doctor yesterday and asked him to explain what was going on. So he explained to me that in your ear you have this little fluid. And the fluid always balances it out in your ear depending on where your head is. It keeps, helps you keep balance. And there's little hairs in your ear called stereocilia. And these stereocilia are touching the fluid. And they're sending a message to your brain what angle the fluid is at to tell your body what position your body's in. Are you with me? The only way you know that you're this way is because your brain is telling you that. And the only way your brain can tell you that is because the fluid just moved and the hair just said you're tilting your head to your right, believe it or not. And so, uh, um, so he says when you, sometimes when you get near ear, nose in, infections in your ear, if the fluid is not as fluid as possible, it's too thick or it's not moving right or there's something wrong with your stereocilia, your ear will not send the correct message to your brain. So even though you moved your head, the fluid's still over here. And it's kind of going over there like honey, you know, just slow. But your eyes are telling you your head is up. So your brain's going, no, it's down. And your eyes say, no, it's up. So your head goes, your brain's going like that, trying to figure out what's true. Are you following me? Okay, if you're not following me, I got to stop because I got other stuff to talk about. But please, I hope you understood it. Every day, your, your spirit is trying to line up God's will with your will. You know, God's saying, here's what I want you to do, and you're saying, no, this is what I want you to do. And, and it's, it's, there's a constant like that. And so I want to take a minute to pray that you would be able to say, be able to, in your heart, say, okay, God, you show me your truth for me today. And when you come to church, you should always come to church no matter what your attitude is. Matter of fact, especially if you got a bad attitude. You should come to church saying, okay, I'm going to be here for, you know, the brother's going to speak for another hour and a half. I'm going to be here. Some of y'all probably wonder if that's true, huh? <laughs> no, I'll be done in a few minutes. <laughs> few is relative. Uh, for however long we're going to be here, I want to make sure that I'm hearing God for me. Because God wants to speak to you. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your word. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to talk about Noah's Ark today. Now, we've been going through the Bible since January, so we're in April now, going into May, and we're only in Genesis 7. So we're going to take a few years to do, go through the whole Bible. We'll speed up here in a little bit. But today we're going to look at three chapters, and we're going to focus on the first verses in those chapters. We're going to see God done, has, is going to do three things in those uh, chapters. Now, if we remember that last time we were in Genesis, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that God told Noah, I'm going to flood the earth. And the reason he told Noah he was going to flood the earth is because there was widespread sexual immorality on the planet. There was widespread evil and wickedness. Every thought on man's heart was continually on wicked and evil. And so God told Noah, 120 years, I'm going to flood the earth. I want you to build a, an ark, a ship, S-I-H-S-H-I-P. And on this ship, you're going to put your family and all the animals on the earth. Now, people say, well, this is a crazy fairy tale. Let me give you a little background on the fairy tale. One, the ark size was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, three stories high, and 45 feet high. The building we're buying is 40, 444 feet long, 45 feet high, three stories, and 180 feet wide. It's ironic that they're very similar. The purpose of the ark was not to navigate and go anywhere. The only purpose of the ark was to float. There was nowhere to go. It was all water. So he said, build this ark, and I'm going to have you build it, and all you're going to do is float. You're going to be in it for about a year. He ended up being in it for about a year from the day he went in to the day he got out. 
Is it big enough to, 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 to hold all the animals? God, Noah wasn't bringing full-grown elephants, full-grown giraffes. All he had to do was to bring a pair, and we're going to see in a minute how many, how many animals, of a set of animals that would be able to reproduce all the species that would come from them. I'll give you an example. Two dogs can produce basically all the dogs we have. Two cats can produce all the cats. When I say cats, kitty cats in your house to lions and tigers. That's the cat family. So God only had to provide animals that would, pr that would be able to reproduce all the species that would come from those animals. And they're made in each kind. Remember God said he made animals after their kind. We call it a genus, G-E-N-U-S. We have families, orders, species, and genuses. Well, genus is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a kind of animal. God would only have to bring that kind into the ark. How did the animals get into the ark? Well, before the flood, they believed that the whole earth was one land mass and one water mass. They believed that because of the, the flood and the upheaval because of the flood, mountains were created and land masses were moved around. The whole earth was changed. Uh, how did the animals get to Noah? Well, if you remember in Genesis 1.19, God brought the animals to Adam. This is all God's in all this. This is no big deal for God. Now, was the ark big enough? They believed that the ark had five, if you, if you want to take this as an interesting statistic or n number, five, uh, equivalent of 522 boxcars uh, that you would see on a train. 522 boxcars that you would see on a train. And the 35,000 animals would fit into 146 of those boxcars, depending on how, how big those animals were. They were thinking they were about a sheep size, small animals. And so here you have this, this flood that supposedly happened worldwide. One of the evidences of the flood are, is the fossil record. You've heard people who study and talk about evolution as the fossil record. They, 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 you see them digging up bones all over the world. You know how those bones got there? The only way you can have a fossil is if an animal is buried in an airtight environment very quickly. You don't get a fossil when an animal just dies on the ground. They decay, they get eaten, and, and they decay and rot into nothing. You get a fossil when an animal that is alive is buried in an airtight environment, which is mud. So when you hear about all these, these fossil records or all these areas where you have all these bones, matter of fact, let me read this one, describe this one to you right here in California. It's... Um, it's called describing the beds of herring fossils, the fish, in the Miocene shales of California. More than one billion fish, averaging six to eight inches in length, died in a four square mile area in the bottom of the bay. A billion fish. How does that happen? The only way that can happen is that they're all covered very quickly with a lot of mud and earth. What did, when did something like that happen? When the flood happened. And there are evidences of these fossil beds all over the planet. That's how you get these animals. With food in their stomach, they were suddenly killed. That's, that, that's, that's evidence of the flood. Jesus talked about the flood. Peter talked about the flood. Uh, the, the, the author of Hebrews in the New Testament calls Noah one of the heroes of faith. It's all through the Bible. But I want, that, that my purpose today is not necessarily to defend all that, but there is a lot of evidence that, there is a, uh, that this happened. Um, but if you look in your notes, there are three things that God did. And we're going to see today. We're going to see that God called, he remembered, and he blessed. God called, he remembered, and he blessed. If you look in your first letter A, God called godly people to serve a godly purpose. If anyone ever comes up to you and says, brother, the Lord has his hand on your life, don't get all, ooh, <laughs> that's true for all y'all. God has called all of you. You know what God says? If anybody wants to come, and follow me. I have a plan for your life. Remember Mission Impossible? Mr. Phelps, we have a mission for you if you choose to accept it. God has a mission for you if you choose to say yes. The Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. How do you know you're chosen? Choose God. God's not going to come knocking on your door one morning. What's your name? Huh? Anthony. What's your last name? Flores. Anthony Flores. We have a mission for you. I'm telling you now he got a mission for you. He does. He got a mission for all of y'all. How do you know it? Just start doing the Bible and find out. Read the Bible and do what it says and you'll find out. 
He has a mission for you. So God's calling these godly people. And look what it says in chapter 7, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Anthony, <laughs> Anthony, where are you from? Here. Where would you go to high school? Okay. The Lord said to Anthony, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous more before righteous before me in this generation. Look in your notes. Eight humans were called into the ark. Eight humans were called into the ark. How do we know eight? Look at verse 7. So Noah with his sons, we know he had three sons, Shem, Shem Ham, and Japheth. Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Look at verse 13. On the same day, Noah, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that's four people, and Noah's wife, that's five, and their three wives of his sons, that's eight, entered the ark. So eight people went into the ark. Next one, both unclean and clean animals went into the ark. How many animals did God bring on the ark? Two by two. Well, not necessarily. Let's read it. Look at verse 2. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, male and female, two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and female, also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, Of the clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and of creeps that creep on the earth, two by two they went into the ark, male and female, as God commanded Noah. He brought, you're going to see, two by two of the unclean animals and seven pairs of the clean animals. Why more clean than unclean? Because the clean, we're going to see in a minute, he sacrificed when he got off the boat. He, made a, he had a, a, a church service, and they killed and burnt the animals. We don't do that today. But if y'all got some cats and dogs, you don't want to do it. We, can, we might be able to take them out back, <laughs> burn them bad boys up. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I've never done that to an animal. I love animals. <laughs> But what they did is they took the clean animals of the clean animals and they killed a few and worshiped God. They didn't want to, if they only had two and they had to kill them, they'd be extinct. So they took a little extra uh, for, for the worship service. Next one. 40 days of rain and 150 days of flooding were called onto the earth. 40 days. Now, it rained 40 days, but you have to understand something. The Bible says the fountains of the deep were also open. That water came from above, uh, above and below. Volcanoes erupted. They believe at the time of Noah it had never rained and the earth was enveloped in a canopy of very uh, a high humidity water vapor around the earth. There was a lot of water su su suspended around the earth. Unlike we see clouds today that fill with water and rain, it never rained. It was just all around the planet. And so this is a big mystery how all this happened, but these are some theories. But the mountains that you see today were all a result of the flood, all the result of volcanic action, all the result of the earth uplifting. Uh, um, and through this cataclysmic um, event. And B, in your notes, God remembered his salvation intentions. Look in verse 1 of chapter 8. The Lord God remembered Noah. The Lord God remembered Noah. The Lord God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark, and God made the wind to pass over the earth and the waters to subside. Now, I want you to think back about this, this ship. They're in this boat, and this boat's going nowhere, it's just going around, okay, back and forth, back and forth. Noah's like, when are we going to stop? Where are we going? Some people's lives are like that, just going nowhere. You got a face you don't like, a body you don't like, girlfriend you don't like, job you don't like, you don't like where you live, you don't like your shoes, you don't like nothing. And everything's just, well, whatever, whatever. And you live a whatever life. And the only thing that offers you fun, hope, is a bottle, some weed, some pornography. That's your release. God says, no, no, I, I remember, I got a plan for you. I have not forgotten. I have a purpose for you. And the day that you say, I'm ready, 
I'll accept you. I just had my spiritual birthday, 20 years I've been saved. It was uh, uh, April 12th. And I remember that day, that was me, gone, whatever. And God said, okay, you ready? I said, yep. And I went from using drugs one day to being a Christian the next day, well, the next minute. I went from being broke up with my girlfriend to being back together. Now we're married uh, 20 years in September one, in the same day. God says, I, I, I haven't forgotten my plan. And so here they're in this boat, and the Bible says he remembered. And look at your notes. It says God's promised deliverance from the flood is remembered. His promised deliverance. Look at verse 16. Chapter 8, verse 16. God said to Noah, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Now, let me, let me stop right there. I know some of y'all are still thinking, do you really believe this happened? Why would God have a guy build a boat and flood the earth and want us to believe something that crazy? That almost makes it that much more believable. Because you, you, you could read this and go, this really happened? Yeah. There's a lot of evidence that something cataclysmic happened on the earth. But I'm thinking, God, why would you do this? He says, you know what? I just want to see who's going to believe me. I mean, I could do it any way I want. But this is the way I'm going to do it. And so anyway, I was just thinking about that as he's telling these guys to come out of this boat. Think about what Noah was thinking about. He's in this boat with all these animals. Ah, whoa, ah, ah. <laughs> Verse 17, bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, every creep, creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. And every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, whatever creeps on the earth according to the families went out of the ark. If you know any creeps, this is where they come from. They came out of the, the, just imagine Noah walking out, all these animals walking out, these little bugs, caterpillars walking out. I mean, <laughs> hey, this is what it says. Look at your notes. Man remembers worship as his first priority. Verse 20. The first thing Noah did was he built an ark to the uh, altar to the Lord and took every of every, not every clean animal, but of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. How often do you thank God? Think about it. I was watching this show the other day. If you have a pen, you want to write this down if you want to see the most fascinating show. It, it's on the internet, but I, it was on TV. It's pbs.org, Life's Greatest Miracle. And I'm watching this. And I've seen, you know, a thousand shows on how babies are made, you know, throughout the years. And, uh, but this was absolutely the best. They showed how sperm are made. They showed how eggs in a woman's womb are made. And by the way, a woman has all her, all her eggs before she's even born. Do you ladies know that? that? When you're in the womb, not only do you have all your eggs already, they're already starting to die off. So by the time you're born, you lost a bunch, okay? And so they showed the eggs, how the eggs are made. They show how the sperm are made. Then they show the journey of the sperm. And what's amazing is that here these sperm, they're just, you know, swimming up, trying to get to the egg, right? <laughs> All y'all did this, girls and guys. Y'all did this before. Okay, so y'all just... You may not be able to do that now, but you did it then, okay? <laughs> and what happens is all these little spermies are, are swimming up, and when they get to somewhere up in the, in the, in the system, there's these little... <laughs> there are these... All through your body, you have cilia, which is little hairs that move. Okay, you have cilia in your lungs. When you get a cold and you, you always, <coughs> it's because these cilia or little hairs in your lungs pushing phlegm out of your lungs. This 24 hours a day is happening. So these little cilia in the, in the woman's tubes, 
And what they do is whatever spermies get to that level, they grab them and they just kind of check them out. And they're just kind of, you know, I don't know what they're doing, but, they, you know, they may be checking out their DNA and their attitude, their personality, you know. I don't know. I'm just thinking, you know. <laughs> but on this show, they were showing this. So they, they see these little spermies, you know, there's wiggling and, and the little hairs on them. And, just, and the, the little hairs decide which sperm can go and which don't. They go, oh, you're going to be an idiot. You're staying right here. We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we are going to exterminate you in a few minutes. <laughs> I'm telling you gospel truth. So they, they'll just, you know, hold this dude, you know, he's, you know, he, he's going to be lazy. This guy, he ain't got too much, you know, uh, IQ. Uh, you know, so they, they hold on to the bad ones and they let the certain ones go. Now, you know, as you know, some of the bad ones got through. <laughs> They probably did this to the, to the little hair and say, hey, hey. <laughs> so anyway, the spermies get up to the, to the egg. Now, this is the most fascinating part. I'm telling you the story is around the egg is a shell called a zona. And all these sperm are hitting on the zona. Bam, bam, bam. I'm trying to get in, trying to get in. Get in. And they can't get in because the zona, is just they can't. But on the outside of the zona are these proteins that stick up like this. And they have little shapes, individual shapes on the end of the protein. And the sperm that can match the shape on the head of the sperm to the protein sticks to the protein. It's a perfect match. And so they're banging and banging. But as soon as they clink that guy or that sperm, that's the one that's going to make it. Because what happens when he's clink, clink, as soon as that match is made, a chemical reaction happens in the head of the sperm, and the shell of the head of the sperm dissolves, and it lets out this protein that burns a hole in the zona. And then the sperm goes in the egg, and then it closes so no other uh, sperm can get in. That is, and then all of a sudden, all this stuff happens and whatever, and then they show the baby grow, and, you know, I, I, yeah, I can go on forever. But, but the point is, I'm watching this going, saying to myself, you know, then he watched the baby grow and the head develops and the fingers and the toes, thinking, that was me one day. That was you. You were like this in a womb. <laughs> you were. What about, why did I tell you that story? When's the last time you thanked God? You know how many babies don't make it? You know how many babies, when they're in that stage, get taken out? And our government will tell you it's a thing and not a baby, it's not a person, it's a person. And this baby's in the womb, and all of a sudden, something happens and they get taken out? We call it abortion. Or, well, the country calls it abortion. And you ever thank God? God, thank you that I made it through that whole process. Thank you that, thank you that, I'm alive. You know, we don't have any problems. You don't have any problems. What's your problem? Someone gave me last week, and I'm going to bring it one day. They gave me uh, the nail, the size of a nail that they used to crucify Jesus. Nine inches. Bam. The first thing I thought about when I grabbed it was, I don't have any problems. First thing that came to my mind, I have no problems. If you came with all your problems to a counselor, and he said, before we talk, let me show you something. <laughs> Hold on to this. Put this against your wrist. And in about an hour, we're going to be nailing you to a tree. Now, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> Thank you, God, that the problems I do have are very fixable. Thank you that the problems I do have, I can walk away from. Because a lot of the problems I have, I create on my own. And I'm not talking about miles only. I'm talking about all of us. They're not. Thank you, God. Here's Noah. There's nobody alive but him and his seven family members and all these animals. And the first thing he does is say, thank you, God. I have breath. Next one. Look in your notes. God remembers his affection for mankind and man's worship. God remembers his affection for mankind and man's worship. Look at verse 21. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma... Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake 
although the imagination of his heart is on evil from his youth. Nor again will I destroy every living thing as I have done. When you praise God, you know what God says? I like that. When you whine and complain and worry and yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, now God's patient, so he's more patient than me. So I can only express this to you as a human. So let me not misrepresent God. But, you know, how often does he say, when are they ever going to trust me? When are they ever going to remember what I did last week, yesterday, five minutes ago? When are they ever going to remember that I'm keeping you alive today? Do you know that your heart beats on its own? Do you know that? Your brain does not tell your heart to beat. It beats all by itself. Do you know that you can take your heart out of your body and for a while it will keep beating? How does that happen, God? Well, you know, if one day we're going to find out how the evolutionary process just, it figured itself out. Please. Please. You know, God makes stuff in such a way that you can never figure out. And the only way you're going to acknowledge it is you're going to either have to just deny God or say it's supernatural. How does a sperm have the ingredients in the, its head to dissolve the zona? Think about that. How does the sperm have the, 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 the protein in its head to dissolve the zona to get into the egg so you could be born? How does it know the shape of the protein sticking out of the zona so it can attach to it, triggering the dissolving of its head to release this other protein to burn it? How? You can't explain that. You will never be able to explain that. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I can breathe oxygen. Thank you, God, that you made oxygen that I can even breathe it. Thank you that you made the lungs with the ability to process oxygen and pr provide the oxygen for me to breathe so I could have it to go into my blood so I could be alive. Thank you that I have blood that even needed oxygen. Look at chapter 9. In your notes, God blessed Noah with a family, with a covenant. Noah's family is blessed with the authority to subdue and multiply. Subdue and multiply. Chapter 9, verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and on that, all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea, they will give in into your hand. Next week, we're going to be talking about where all the ethnic groups of the planet come from. How God, from two individual people, one man and one woe man, can produce every ethnic group on the face of the planet earth, and you will see next week not only how that happened but you will also learn next week that every single one of us on the face of the earth is the same color now some of you ain't gonna like that because you think your color is best your color ain't best because you all got the same color and you might not like what that color is but it's true we're gonna see that next week um to two people god told noah and his family and it's gonna be from noah and his family by the way go multiply all the earth. Now, if you don't believe that, then you must believe then in evolution that there was a, a, a Chinese ape that, that evolved in China. <laughs> then there was a Mexican ape that, in Mexico. <laughs> then there was an Australian ape that, uh, in Aust is that, that, maybe that's what you believe. I, I don't know. Maybe there was an Eskimo ape that evolved in Eskimo. <laughs> and then that's how you got all the people. I don't know. It's not how it happened. Third, I and mean second in, your, in number C, mankind is blessed with an expanded diet. Expanded diet. Verse 3, he told Noah, every moving thing that lives on the f shall be food for you. I have given you all things even as the green herbs. If you remember in Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve and all the animals were vegetarians. They only ate fruits and vegetables. God is now saying you can eat meat, fish, all that kind of stuff. Now, it's not necessarily the healthiest thing for you. When you if you ever get cancer or get a sickness, what they tell you? Eat fruit and vegetables and drink a lot of water and you'll be fine. Why? Because you can get all the nutrients you need from that. You can get proteins from fruit and vegetables. 
vitamins, minerals, all that stuff. You don't need to eat meat. And some of the meat and pork stuff you eat is no good for you. But go ahead and eat it. So when you go to in and out you need to thank God for chapter 9, verse 3. <laughs> he says, now I bless the double-double with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to have an animal style, go for it. <laughs> but know this, and, and, and know this, that there are some things that God allows us to do that aren't necessarily the best thing to do. Some of y'all are, everybody's allergic to different kinds of foods and stuff. You need to know. Because even though you're allowed to eat everything, some of the stuff you shouldn't eat because of how your body reacts to it. So you want to be very careful. My, my brother-in-law, he's allergic to uh, shellfish and, tuna, and fish, tuna. Uh, I don't know if it's all fish, but, but uh, so, you know, we've been kind of planning out whenever he, you know, messes up. We're just going to put some crab meat in his sandwich. <laughs> his face all swells up. His vocal cord, he gets all, he'll die. So, you know, he just... So just because it's allowed doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. Last one. Mankind is blessed with a rainbow as a sign. The University of Hawaii has claimed the rainbow as their symbol. The gay nation, and I don't even know what the, what they were, how they would refer to themselves, but they, the gay, I'll just refer to them as the gay nation, has claimed the rainbow as their sign. If you see a rainbow on a car, that means that person's gay or the owner of the car. No, no, no. The rainbow is God's sign to man that I will never flood the earth. Matter of fact, let's read it. We didn't read it. Keep putting our stuff away. Let's read it. It says in verse 11, chapter 9, Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, Never again shall there be flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living thing that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living thing of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. When you see a rainbow, don't go, oh, look, it's so pretty. Oh, it's the, the, it's the prism, rosy bib, or red, orange, yellow, blue. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> There's all the colors. No, no, no. I mean, that's true. But remember that God made those colors, made the light, and made the rainbow. How come the rainbow doesn't do that? How come it doesn't go straight? How come it's not just a, a, a big rainbow? It just goes like that. He says, I'm going to make it do that. Now, you may say, well, you know, we can scientifically prove why it does that. Well, God made the science behind the proof. <laughs> Where does biology come from? God created it. He created science to govern everything we know that exists, but he lives outside of science. That's why he can overcome science. That's why Jesus, when he resurrected from the dead, walked through the wall, because he was in a whole different realm. Whew. What I want to do today is I want to call the worship team up, and I want to remember the second to the last point we made, that God, that, that Noah's first action was he worshiped God. Let's worship God and thank him for what you have thank him for who you are thank him for the opportunity to be alive for the opportunity to see walk talk and maybe you can't see walk or talk you're alive and you have an opportunity to say, to serve God not serve your job not make a living but to walk with God the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. Listen to that. Enoch walked with God and then Enoch was gone because God took him. I promise you Enoch was not complaining. He was walking with God. That was a whole bunch of fun. And you know what? He's still walking with God. 
You can walk with God, and guess what? You can be not. What does that mean? Is that you can cease to be the person people experience when they talk to you. You can walk with God and be not. You could be the, when people talk with you and experience you, they can experience God. What an awesome privilege. He's given no other creature that opportunity. So let's all bow our heads and pray. We're going to have the man to come up. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the flood. We thank you for your word to explain to us what happened and why. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to walk with you, worship you. Lord, there may be somebody here that just wants to say thank you to you this morning. If today you need to say thank you to God, just pray with me. We're not going to ask you to do anything but pray. In the privacy of your heart, say, dear God, you've blessed me. As I sit here today, I know tomorrow's not promised. So I want to say thank you. Thank you that I grew in my mother's womb. Thank you that I was born successfully. Thank you that I survived my childhood. Thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that I have an opportunity to serve you. Thank you, God. As you 